Well, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for an update on our vaccination rollout, guidance for schools, and security here at uh, our Capitol. Last night in my State of the Commonwealth speech, I promised you an update on our vaccination plan. Last week, I laid out our goals, as you may remember. We want to be vaccinating 25,000 Virginians a day as quickly as possible. We currently are getting about 110,000 vaccine doses per week. Second, we want every vaccinator, health departments, hospitals, pharmacies, to administer vaccine doses as fast as possible. We want them to focus on priority populations, but we also want vaccines in arms. Here's where we are since then, a week later. Only a handful of states have given more doses than Virginia, and they're bigger than we are. States like California, Texas, and Florida. In fact, as of right now, Virginia has distributed 100% of the doses we've received to 160 vaccination sites across our Commonwealth. I have visited clinics where people are receiving vaccines, and I've seen things work very smoothly. Everyone is working hard and eager to do more, and we all know the need is large. We have 8.5 million people, and our current vaccines require two shots to be the most effective. That's about 17 million shots, so we have a lot of work ahead of us. A number of our health districts moved to start vaccinating 1B populations this week which is good news. This includes our teachers, frontline essential workers, and people aged 75 and over. And I want to thank everyone who has been working throughout this pandemic to take care of people, hospitals, clinics, agencies on aging, and centers for independent living, social service workers, employees at long-term care facilities, and more. We're working to get to the most vulnerable folks first. This morning, I spoke with all of our local health directors and the leaders of Virginia's hospitals. My message to them was simple. Thank you, and Virginia needs everyone to move faster. These are the leaders to get large-scale vaccinations done. They are our partners in this, and we are grateful. Virginia's hospitals and health systems have administered the majority of shots in arms so far in Virginia. In northern Virginia, Innova Health System has administered more than 35,000 doses. In fact, the first day Innova workers could register for vaccination, they had 9,000 employees sign up. Now Innova is working with local health departments to help vaccinate 55,000 teachers, public safety personnel, and people aged 75 and over. Other health systems are also helping vaccinate 1B populations. Valley Health in Shenandoah and Mary Washington Healthcare in Fredericksburg are standing up clinics in large spaces that could accommodate several thousand people. And other health systems are doing their part as well. I'm grateful for our partnership with our hospitals in Virginia, and they're going to be a great help in the coming weeks as we speed up our pace of vaccinations. In recent days, we've seen a new attitude among our federal partners. We have been able to work much more closely with them. Tuesday afternoon, HHS sent new guidance to states. They told us states should immediately expand vaccinations to 65 and up and those under 64 who have a comorbid condition. HHS promised to help states rapidly expand channels for vaccination. And they said, they said $3 billion in additional funding is on the way to help states make all of this happen. And that is good news. This is what we've been saying, that a better federal partnership and support will help all the states get this done faster. And this afternoon, uh, as soon as I finish here, I'll be speaking with Jeffrey Zentz, who has been tapped by President-elect Biden to lead the coronavirus response. 
communication between the federal, state, and local authorities is key. So in Virginia, we're following the CDC recommendations. We're going to move people who are 65 and up or who have comorbid uh, conditions into phase 1B. If your health district is already there, that's now. But everyone in Virginia will be there by the end of the month. This means about half of Virginia is now eligible to receive the vaccine. That's a major logistical effort, and it is not going to happen overnight. Everyone will need to be patient. It's going to happen as fast as it can be done. And we're moving faster every day. Monday, we vaccinated more than 15,000 people. Tuesday, it was more than 17,000. Last Thursday and Friday, we topped 17,000 doses each day. So I'm counting on everyone to help us get this done. Hospitals and public health departments, as well as partners in businesses, colleges and universities, and private doctor's offices and pharmacies. I've been to a number of vaccination clinics in recent days, and they are well run and they are very efficient. They're organized with tables for check-in, chairs for getting your shot, and an area to wait afterward to make sure you don't have any allergic reactions or side effects. Uh, I went to T.C. Williams High School in Alexandria earlier this week where they vaccinated 800 teachers. At Fairfield Middle School right here in Henrico yesterday, they vaccinated about 400 health care providers. I know that as localities have moved to vaccinating some of our frontline workers, teachers, and older people, they've seen a large amount of interest in appointments. And that is great because we need people to get this vaccine. It is our only way out of this pandemic. Now I'd like to ask Dr. Dr. Danny Avula, who is our COVID vaccine coordinator, to come talk about the plans and logistics for large scale vaccinations. And I would remind all of you that uh, Danny was tasked with this uh, additional uh, position only a week ago. Uh, he had plenty on his plate at that time, and we've asked him to put even more on his plate, and he's just, he's done commendable work. So, Danny, uh, thank you for being here, and thanks for all you're doing. Welcome. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it has been a, an intense week in thinking about how we're going to vaccinate Virginia together. And I think the governor is exactly right. We need all of these different channels of vaccine. We, the, our hospital partners have been amazing doing the bulk of the, va the vaccination over the past few weeks. Uh, in this week and in future weeks, you'll see more and more vaccine coming to private providers and to pharmacies. Um, the health departments continue to, to stand up large-scale vaccination clinics. But what we recognize is if we're going to get to 50,000 doses a day, which is what we need to do if we're going to get herd immunity in the Commonwealth, we really do need to get to uh, a, an infrastructure that can handle 50,000 doses a day, um, that we're going to need to do more. And so part of what more looks like is uh, standing up fixed site mass vaccination centers across the Commonwealth, uh, places that will be six to seven day a week operations uh, that initially will be planned and partnered with, uh, with health departments, with medical reserve corps, uh, with health systems. But eventually our, our goal is to get this staffed by the National Guard and by uh, contracted vaccinators who will be able to provide this service uh, in large scale. Um, we're right now mapping out places across the Commonwealth that are already doing this, right? Fairfax uh, was able to get 4,000 individuals vaccinated in a day uh, at their government center, and, and uh, they're doing about 1,000 doses a day at some of their different sites. Uh, Virginia Beach Convention Center did almost 1,000 doses a day in, in one day this past week. We did 800 here at Arthur Ashe. And so we are, are quickly getting to scale, but we need to get to the staffing model that allows that consistent delivery of doses day in, day out. Uh, and gets us to our 50,000 doses a day. So uh, stay tuned for more information about where those sites will be as our plans come together. Uh, I, I, as soon as next week, we should see some, uh, some more movement in the mass vaccination arena, as well as uh, more vaccine as it's available through all of those other channels. Thank you, Dr. Avula. Getting everyone vaccinated is the largest deployment of volunteers that we have ever seen. 
and we need you to help. The Virginia Medical Reserve Corps is already training new volunteer vaccinators. If you have medical experience, you're a retired doctor or nurse, or you just want to help with the logistics, please reach out to that program. At the clinics I've visited, VMRC volunteers in yellow T-shirts have been vital to the organization, keeping everything running smoothly. We're grateful to everyone who is volunteering and everyone involved in this massive vaccination effort. You know, this, is a, this has just been a real success story. The number of people around the Commonwealth that said, I want to be part of this solution, I want to, to help, and it doesn't matter their politics or uh, any of that. Uh, this is really, you know, I look at this as a way of really pulling Virginians together. So to all of you that have chosen to volunteer, and if there are others out there that, that want to help, uh, I really thank you for that, and I encourage that. Uh, the vaccinations or the vaccines are really our, our way out of this pandemic. The vaccines and continuing to follow the guidelines on masks, distancing, and hand washing. So I continue to urge every Virginian to get vaccinated when your turn comes. I will do it, and so will our family. Vaccines are how we get back to a near normal. This is how we reopen our schools and rebuild our economy through the vaccine. It is the light at the end of a long and dark tunnel. And while it is a massive undertaking and it will take some months to get to everyone, I promise your turn is coming and soon. But I know there is hesitancy out there. I'd like to ask Wayne Turnage to come up. Wayne will be a familiar face to many Virginians. He was the chief of staff for former Governor Tim Kaine He's held various other positions in Virginia government, and now he is the deputy mayor for D.C.'s Health and Human Services Agency and the director of the D.C. Department of Health Care Finance. So I'd like you to hear about Wayne's experience with the COVID vaccine. He is a good man. Uh, you all probably know him. I trust him, uh, and you can as well. So, Wayne, welcome. Thank you for being with us today. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Governor, for that uh, very generous introduction. It is uh, indeed an honor to join you to discuss the uh, critical importance of the vaccine program as the primary means to blunt the spread of this pernicious disease uh, with, that has a devastating effect, especially among communities of color. The latest national numbers uh, from this pandemic, 230,000 new infections per day, more than 4,400 deaths per day, which are, are growing by nearly 50% every two weeks, offer further indication that we are in the worst pandemic this country has seen in more than 100 years. I am here today to speak to the importance of the vaccine, which is quite frankly, as the governor notes, our best chance to defeat COVID-19 and return to the way of life that we, are, uh, we, that we so desperately miss. I offer my brief remarks as someone who has volunteered for and participated in one of the vaccine trials and who has since received the first shot after learning that I was injected with saline water or the so-called placebo as a participant in the, in the study trial. Epidemiologists uh, explain that this virus will continue to propagate until it can no longer find fuel among the population. We further understand uh, that to build a fortress to prevent this continuing spread Roughly 60 to 70 percent of the 330 million people in this country must be vaccinated, effectively creating through mass inoculation a much, the much-discussed herd immunity. Yet, in jurisdictions all over the country, large numbers of African Americans have expressed a stubborn resistance to the government's expectation that, U that U.S. citizens agree to be vaccinated in hopes of controlling this devastating spread of, of, of COVID-19. Our reluctance is understandable, for it is born of a justifiable mistrust of medical experiments that were once implemented in the black community using methods that violated the most basic research ethics for, ex for conducting experimental trials. Notwithstanding this egregious history and based on personal experience, I stand before you to, to bear witness to the process that produced the U.S. vaccines in particular, the safety record compiled by the vaccines during the studies 
and the, uh, and the effectiveness that was proven by rigorous experimental research study designs, which are the superior method for studying the efficacy of any drug or vaccine before these products are released on the market. So I want to quickly discuss three points and hopefully increase the comfort of, the, of my community with these vaccines. First, vaccine design. One of the routinely expressed fears of the black community is that the vaccine will actually expose them to the virus and make them sick. However, these vaccines are not similar to the most traditional viruses, the vaccines, which often consisted of the actual virus itself. Uh, for example, the polio vaccine was made from the live virus prior to 2000, and since then it has been made from a deadened or attenuated uh, form of that same uh, virus. Likewise, vaccines for measles, the flu, rubella, and the chickenpox are made from a live or weakened virus. Though extremely rare, in such cases there is always the possibility that an attenuated virus can turn pathogenic and cause the disease both in the person that was vaccinated and their close contacts. But the current vaccines to fight COVID in this country are built from a new and smartly innovative technology based on a single molecule that has the ability to communicate with your body's protein-making machinery. Making protein is a normal biological function of your body. Based on the instructions that your body receives from this single molecule, your body is forced to make spike proteins that have the exact appearance of the virus, and thus your immune system is tricked into developing antibodies to fight COVID should you ever become exposed. There is no chance that these vaccines will transform into the actual virus and make you sick. Second, vaccine trials. Allow me to make a few comments about how they were operated. These studies were designed to determine if the vaccines were both safe and effective. In the trial which I participated, 30,000 people were studied, half received the vaccine, and the other half received the placebo, the saline water. Then we were told to go live our lives, but to continue to wear a mask and continue to social distance because we did not know if we had either the vaccine or the placebo. The results from the study indicated that among the persons who were later found to be affected, infected with COVID, fully 95% were in the placebo group and only 5% had the vaccine. Moreover, among those whose infections were characterized as severe, with one person actually dying, none had received the vaccine. The, so the takeaway is that once you get vaccinated, and you should remember this, you have less than a 5% chance of contracting COVID. And if you get infected despite having the vaccine, there appears to be next to a zero chance that you will become deathly ill. Third, safety. The key safety question with any vaccines and any medicine is, is whether the trial data show that the vaccine's benefits outweigh safety concerns. For the 15,000 or the 30,000 people who actually received the vaccine in the trial, the data indicate that not only does the vaccine protect against a potentially fatal illness, its only demonstrated side effects were short-term and mild, mostly fatigue, headache, and some muscle aches. I can attest to the fatigue, but after I got my first shot, for the next two days, I slept more than I can remember. There was no evidence to suggest a relationship between taking the vaccine and experiencing any serious illness. Some are worried about the possibility of serious side effects that were not uncovered during the short trials. To address this possibility, all of the pharmaceutical companies will continue to follow persons who have been vaccinated for more than two years. So with respect to safety, the takeaway is the benefits are exceedingly clear. A 95% reduction in your chances of contracting a disease that has already killed 385,000 people in the United States and is now eating or claiming 4,300 additional lives a day. Projections show that in two weeks, the number of deaths could possibly surpass 6,500 per day. By comparison, the risk of side effects is both minimal and low. Are the risks zero? No, but the risks are clearly outweighed by the vaccine's benefits. I will conclude my remarks by sharing three numbers that I hope all of my, all, all African Americans, especially those like me with underlying medical conditions, consider as they contemplate whether they, they will take this vaccine. The numbers are 1.4, 3.7, and 2.8.
and they indicate the greater odds we face relative to our white counterparts for contracting COVID, 1.4 times greater than the odds for whites. Hospitalizations for COVID, 3.7 times greater than the odds for white, whites. And dying from COVID, 2.8 times greater than the odds for whites. So please get vaccinated. It will literally save your life. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. I mentioned that this week I visited T.C. Williams High School where teachers were getting their vaccine shots. I gave, it gave me a lot of optimism. I know that parents and teachers and students are eager to get back to the classroom. We all want to reopen schools safely and the right way. I know that parents and teachers are concerned about the long-term effects of virtual learning on children. You're worried that they're not doing as well in the classes. And they miss their friends and they miss their routines. In the long term, we need to look at adjusting our school calendar and the probability of schools operating year-round to make up for some of this time. But in the short term, all of our school divisions need to be making plans for how to reopen schools. It's not going to happen next week, but I want our schools to come from this starting point. How do we get schools open safely? Schools are places where we can do all of the mitigation measures easily, social distancing, mask wearing, and cleaning. And while getting everyone vaccinated, it's not necessary to reopen schools. It, it will make it a lot easier. So later this afternoon, the Department of Education is issuing new guidance to our local school divisions. The emphasis will change. Instead of school should be closed, we're going to approach it from the starting point of schools need to be open, and here are the ways to do that safely. The guidance will lay out a pathway, including how to use mitigation measures in school buildings and how to prioritize students. For example, students with disabilities are those for whom English is a second language. Every school division will have to decide what works best for it, working with the local health department. I know all of Virginia shares the goal of getting our children back to school. I'd like to introduce a couple of our friends, first PTA President Donna Colombo, and then Virginia Education Association President James Fetterman to talk about what this means for parents and for our teachers. Thank you all both for being here, Donna. If you could join us, thank you so much. Good afternoon, Governor, and I thank you for the opportunity to be part of a very valuable group of leaders in education and in our Commonwealth. Virginia PTA leaders across the Commonwealth have continued to be engaged with our families, our students, and our teachers over the past 10 months, and we will continue to do so as we support decisions that we feel are the best for all of us. We will share the updated guidance that is being shared through the VDOE channels as we know that the guidance that is being shared is what is best for the safety and health of all of our families. What Virginia PTA wants is what we all want, a return to schools when our teachers are safe and when our families feel safe. We know that the vaccine is here and with a plan is available. The guidance that the VDOH, VDOE, the Department of Health, and the Governor's Office includes data on a variety of tools, but when it comes down to it, we are all fighting for the same thing, the opportunity to help everyone. This is not just a Virginia coronavirus. This is worldwide, and Virginia PTA continues to provide support, share guidance, consult with national PTA and state partners, and that also includes supporting the Governor's budget that we know will help all of our children, beginning with our youngest, our granddaughter, Sophia, your fifth grader, your high schooler, your college student, your student that has taken a gap year or learning, or looking for that trade job to support his or her future, the teachers and staff that are truly the heroes of our children. We all know that last year wasn't what any of us expected. As we move ahead, we encourage you to continue to follow the guidance that is provided 
reach out to your schools and your PTAs. And remember that our families and communities support our students and teachers. We all want what is best for them, as well as everyone that has been affected by the coronavirus, everyone that has been affected by economic struggles, and we all need to help each other make this new year a healthy, positive, and productive one. On behalf of Virginia PTA, thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and be safe. Thank you so much, Don. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. First, I want to make one thing very clear. Teachers and school support staff want with all their hearts to be back in their classrooms and their buses in every school division in this great commonwealth. That is who we are. That is literally what we signed up for. Everyone, school division employees, parents, and community members and state officials, have done an unbelievable job coping with this unprecedented challenge of this global pandemic that has killed more than 380,000 Americans. We will get back to in-person instruction everywhere. The real question is, when will we have uh, completed the action to make in-person learning safe? We get all of our educators vaccinated and put in the necessary processes for social distancing, PPE, reporting of cases, and so on. And everyone must do their part in the schools and just as importantly at home and around their communities uh, to minimize the spread of the virus. If you are anywhere indoors and you're not wearing a mask, you're not helping us to reopen our schools to in-person learning. We all must do our part. Last week, the VEA recommended that all lessons remain virtual until each of our educators are vaccinated and we are heartened that this process has started. What we are experiencing is an historic health crisis, and we need to make sure that the health and safety of our students, their families and communities, and our educators is our top priority. Simply put, school buildings are not the place to be while this virus surges and health professionals struggle to save lives. Across the Commonwealth, our local school union leaders are engaging with their respective schools and health officials and are working to be a part of the solution to this crisis. I commend the localities where educators are already being vaccinated and where provisions are being made to make sure that the schools are safe places to be where we all want them to be. The 40,000 members of the Virginia Education Association will continue to work constructively to safely get our students and educators back into the classrooms. Thank you for the opportunity to share, and I am a proud COVID survivor. Thanks so much to, to both of you, Donna and James. Now, before we turn to your questions, I want to talk about a different issue, the threats of violence to state capitals and security leading up to next week's inauguration of our new president. Let me start by saying violence has no place here or in Washington. Free speech is a value we all hold dear, but violence is something else entirely. In America, we are proud of our tradition of a peaceful transition of power, and make no mistake, that is what will happen next week. Virginia has sent Virginia State Troopers and more than 2,000 Virginia National Guard members to the District of Columbia. Earlier this week, D.C. Mayor Bowser and I met with them. I told them how important this mission is and how proud I am of them. I do not want these brave men and women to be in danger. We want them back home safe, and we need them back to help with vaccinations and a lot of other duties that they have in our Commonwealth. But when they get home is dependent on those who would put them in danger by coming to our state capital or Washington with violent plans. So I need everyone to listen very closely. If you're planning to come here or up to Washington with ill intent in your heart, you need to turn around right now and go home. You are not welcome here and you're not welcome in our nation's capital. And if you come here and act out, 
Virginia will be ready. Our law enforcement agencies, the state police, the city of Richmond police, our capital police, all are working in close coordination. Richmond Mayor LeVar Stoney is here, and I'll ask him to say a few words. Mayor, thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, I thank you for this opportunity to let people know that Richmond is aware, we're prepared, and has, we've been planning for weeks for the upcoming Lobby Day. We did this long before the disturbing events that occurred at the U.S. Capitol last week. As many of you may know, earlier this week, uh, we declared a state of emergency here in the city of Richmond. Our goal is the same as it's always been, and that is respect and protect the right to peacefully demonstrate, regardless of your viewpoint, and to safeguard the public health and safety of Richmond's residents and their property. Yes, we all have a right to be heard, but we all have a right to be safe and free from fear and intimidation. So let me be clear. The violent, lawless insurrection and assault on democracy and its institutions that unfolded last week in Washington, D.C. will not be tolerated in the city of Richmond. I don't care who you are. We will protect this city, this capital, this commonwealth, and the lives and property of all the law-abiding people who live here. Now, last year's Lobby Day, while unsettling in many ways for the proliferation of firearms on our streets, came and went peacefully. We have the same expectation for lawful demonstration this year and expect your full cooperation and respect. Now, a lot has changed since last year. We also expect your full cooperation and respect of our new laws. We expect visitors and residents alike to obey our new laws, one of which prohibits firearms in our public buildings and city parks and at gatherings and events that are should be permitted or are permitted or should be permitted. Signs where this ordinance is enforced will be posted, and we expect who, those who come to Richmond to comply with our laws. So let me repeat the violence and the insurrectionist activities that we saw at our nation's capital will not be tolerated in Virginia's capital and to our residents. There will be road closures starting this weekend. And in addition to that, we ask that you avoid areas of downtown Richmond. It's our hope as we near the inauguration of the president-elect that we can still celebrate uh, democracy in our country, in our city, in our commonwealth peacefully. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor LeVar Stoney. Our Secretary of Public Safety, Brian Moran, and Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Carlos Hopkins, are also here with us today, and they will tell you more about how seriously we are taking these threats. Secretary Moran, thank you for joining us. Governor, thank you. On behalf of the administration and an outstanding public safety team, I want to assure Virginians that we are taking all necessary measures to ensure the work of our Virginia General Assembly. We want to make sure that work proceeds safely and without interruption. Importantly, and at the same time, we will be protecting individuals' constitutional rights to freedom of speech and assembly. The Division of Capitol Police, Richmond City Police, Department of General Services, Virginia Commonwealth University, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, and our Virginia State Police, who we are so proud of their actions last week. They have established a unified command to prepare and manage security for Capitol Square, the Science Museum, and adjoining streets and neighborhoods for Monday, January 18th. The unified command structure successfully managed the 2020 Lobby Day. 
during which approximately 20,000 protesters flooded Capitol Square and surrounding streets for several hours. Despite the sizable crowd and the presence of numerous firearms, the demonstration proceeded without incident. Planning for this lobby's lobby day began, as you heard, many, many weeks ago. However, the violent attack on our nation's capital and the threats against state capitals across the country have led to enhanced preparation by our unified command. The Department of General Services has closed Capitol Square, and it will remain closed through at least next Thursday. Security fencing is being installed around the square, and additional security measures are in place to protect the buildings on the square, including our Capitol. The Virginia National Guard will have personnel on standby to assist law enforcement, and we, you'll hear from Secretary Hopkins in a moment. Like last year, the public can expect to see an abundance of local and state law enforcement personnel posted at stationary points and patrolling throughout the city. We will not be able to discuss with you operational tactics, but want to assure city residents, workers, and business owners that law enforcement is well prepared for rapid response and mitigation if an incident or act of violence should occur around our Capitol or at the Science Museum. We encourage the public to remain vigilant and notify local or state police of any suspicious activity. The latest information on Capitol Square closures, road closures, and other advisories are available to the public on our Unified Command social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter, please visit VA Capital 2021. These platforms will be updated in real time leading up to and including Lobby Day 2021. Finally, I want to make it clear and join uh, others to say that uh, those who might be uh, intending to do harm to the citizens and property of our Commonwealth of Virginia will not be tolerated. This violence will not be tolerated. We are taking the necessary measures to preserve and protect the people and property of our Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Secretary Hopkins. Thank you, Governor. From the moment that the Governor ordered the Guard to support uh, the district, uh, we began one of the largest mobilizations in recent memory. Uh, as the governor indicated, currently we have over 2,400 Guard members supporting the security efforts in the district. Uh, we've been in constant communication with the district representatives within the mayor's office, uh, with my counterparts there in the district and their emergency management department. I've worked closely with Secretary Moran and members of law enforcement here in the Commonwealth uh, to ensure that our responses are coordinated and that the Guard is available to support their efforts. Uh, and when I talk about the extent of the mobilization, uh, just so that you understand the, the scale at which the Guard had to operate, within a matter of hours, we had pulled these men and women, many of whom are students, uh, many who work here at various jobs around the Commonwealth, from their homes, from their jobs, from their schools, had them muster in the middle of the night, equipped them with the necessary resources and training materials, and then sent them on the road to D.C. to be in place to support our nation's democracy. And so we did all of that in a matter of hours. Uh, it, it was a mobilization that would rival any of our active duty counterparts. But it's just a testament to the strength of the men and women of our Virginia National Guard as they live out the motto of being always ready and always there. And so they've been an incredibly resilient force. But they're not just supporting the district and its law enforcement uh, needs, but we also have the Guard, as Secretary Moran mentioned, here available to support our law enforcement team here in Richmond over the course of the next several days and through the inauguration. So we have those troops who will be in standby uh, as necessary and requested by law enforcement, and they are also equally equipped and trained for the mission that we've asked them to support. But the Guard is not just supporting our law enforcement, but they're also supporting our vaccination efforts as well. Uh, when I've come before you previously to talk about how we've been engaged in the testing process, uh, we also intend to support uh, Dr. Avul and his team as we get further into the, into the vaccine distribution and utilize the resources of our Guard there as well. Uh, but their purpose is to be always there and always ready for the Commonwealth. Uh, and they have done that in the past and they will continue to do so in the future. And I couldn't be any more proud of the men and women of our National Guard. 
And so I thank you, Governor, and the team. Uh, and as always, we stand ready. Thank you, Secretary. Be glad to take some questions. Governor, can, can you tell, are you deploying National Guard troops in Richmond? I mean, can you clarify that just a little bit more? And then are there any guesstimations on crowd size at this point or exactly what threat people should be looking out for? Uh, the first part of your question, the, the Virginia National Guard will be available here uh, in Richmond. Um, and as far as numbers, uh, I don't have any exact numbers. I, I've just heard the you know, the intelligence that a lot of others have heard that, uh, that all 50 capitals uh, in this uh, country are potentially under attack uh, this weekend and during uh, inauguration. So uh, we take those uh, seriously, and as you see, we're, we're going to be prepared. Thank you. Regarding the vaccine effort, there's a lot of anecdotal stories going around about people in 1A who haven't received a vaccine yet, while people in 1B or maybe even 1C who live in the same area have, have received it. So recognizing that it's important to get shots in arms, but we also want to get to the most vulnerable people first. How are you working to further prioritize the vaccine, vaccination process? Yeah, the question is uh, individuals that are in 1A, and just to, to clarify that, 1A are our frontline healthcare workers in our emergency rooms, our ICUs, uh, et cetera. Um, and then also individuals in our, um, in our long-term nursing home facilities, long-term care facilities, both staff and, and residents. So uh, we're doing it in parallel, the answer to your question. Uh, you know, initially we were gonna do phase 1A, and then when we saw that that was near complete, moved to phase 1B. But, uh, we, we realize, uh, and we've made some modifications, and uh, so 1B uh, was, uh, we went into 1B actually in, in, on Monday uh, in 11 of our health districts, and, and that is expanding as we uh, speak, and, and we've even made further modifications now. We initially, uh, in 1B, it was age 75 and up. Now we've changed that to 65. So um, as we receive doses from uh, our pharmaceuticals um, and as we put those uh, doses into to arms, uh, we will continue to modify. The, the point I made uh, last week, uh, and one of the reasons why we set these goals, we brought in Dr. Avola, we've activated the National Guard, uh, we've created a policy uh, of either use it or lose it. The reason we did that is because at the end of each week, uh, we don't want any doses in Virginia to have not been used. So uh, we're modifying our plan as we move forward to be able to accept the doses that are sent to us and to be able to put those, uh, uh, give them to uh, individuals across Virginia as expeditiously and safely as we can. Yeah. Um, a couple questions. I know that you spoke with hospitals and local health systems this morning. Yes. And when you look at the CDC, Virginia is still ranked low when it comes to actually getting those shots in arms. So I was wondering if you could speak to that um, and if there's any indication of what's causing that bottleneck. And that'll be my first one. <laughs> How many questions do you get today? Just two. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's a, it's a good question. And, you know, I, I would start, Kate, by saying this is probably one of the most massive logistical uh, efforts that uh, has ever taken place in Virginia to, uh, to when you think about it, to get uh, 8.5 million uh, Virginians. Uh, uh, not one dose, but, but two doses. And so, you know, I'm pleased with the way that we've rolled it. We've been in this for, for four weeks now. Uh, obviously, uh, we'd like to do it faster. And, you know, we, we've made the modifications that I've outlined, and uh, we'll continue to, to follow those. Uh, we'll follow Dr. Abula's lead. He's done a tremendous job. Um, and we'll continue. I think if you look at the seven-day running average of number of doses per day, to Virginians, you'll see that it's going up each day, and, and we're going to meet our goal uh, just as soon as we can, that first goal being 25,000 and then 50,000. And, and again, by uh, hopefully early to midsummer, uh, all Virginians that are willing to accept the vaccination will, will be vaccinated. Well, I'm going to give you three more questions today. No. 
I'll only take one. Um, and the second is just, you know, I'm wondering if you have considered putting in place new restrictions statewide when it comes to mitigating the spread of COVID, especially when it comes to emphasizing that schools reopen. You know, we're still seeing wide community spread. I know the hospital association has asked for new restrictions. So I'm wondering, um, you know, if we can expect those and if not, why? Well, a short answer to your question, all options are on the table. And uh, I have been in close communication with a lot of people across Virginia, as has our staff, but uh, particularly the, the hospital association. I have another meeting this afternoon uh, scheduled with them. Uh, we'll be discussing the vaccination uh, rollout and, and also uh, their capacity. That's really important as, as we move forward to know how many ICU beds they have, how many ventilators are in use, uh, how they're doing with their staffing. Um, so that's almost a daily uh, communication we have. And uh, for the most part, we're stable right now. If you look at our numbers today, we had just over 5,000 new cases, 33,000 additional tests, 74 additional deaths. Uh, so we follow this very closely. We've put some, you know, I think very stringent restrictions in place, uh, taking measures to, to mitigate those numbers. Uh, you know what those are, the wearing of this mask, both indoors and, and outdoors, the closing of restaurants and bars at, at 10 o'clock, a curfew uh, after midnight. So uh, the main thing, and I'll take this opportunity to, to reiterate it, the, the, this pandemic is in the hands of Virginians. We know what works. We know what's driving the numbers. Uh, we know that when people gather, for example, in uh, their places of residence, um, and people are coming from different homes in different you know, scenarios, that's what's driving the number. Uh, places of worship, uh, we're encouraging all of these individuals to follow those guidelines. We know that those work, and so uh, that's a long-winded answer to your question, but the bottom line is all options are on the table. I look at that every day, and uh, if and when we need to make other, uh, take other measures, we will. Much. Governor, the biggest issue we're hearing down here in Pittsburgh, perhaps the rest of the um, Trader Health District, that the pace down here is a little bit slower than and some of the other locations, uh, especially because in fact we, we uh, hospitals and all down here serve so many communities of color. What is the state going to be doing in the next uh, days or weeks to possibly ramp up the uh, speed for? Uh, communities of color that have been served to uh, get their, their vaccines. Yes, I'm going to let Dr. Avula address that. Danny, thanks. I, I think I heard the question was, which is that in some parts of the states we're having difficulty getting vaccine out, how do we make sure we prioritize getting vaccine to communities of color? Is that right? Okay. Um, well, I, we, we definitely recognize that, uh, you know, as the governor said, this, this hasn't gone as, as smoothly as we could have hoped. I mean, we, but it is moving forward. And when you look at that uh, epi curve of the number of doses that are given each day, uh, the fact that our seven-day average is almost 12,000 doses a day, we are heading the right direction. Um, we do recognize that there are certain parts of state, our state that need more resources. And so part of my role is helping uh, connect the local health districts and the health systems in different parts of the state, making sure that uh, when we know how much vaccine is allocated to certain hospitals and certain health districts, uh, that they are having, they're making a coordinated plan to get after initially those 1A, because the, the, the particular part of the state that you have referenced uh, has not, is still in 1A, um, and that we can get them to 1B as quickly as possible. So uh, you know, your, your specific question about how do we address this in communities of color, uh, you know, right now with uh, 1A healthcare workers and long-term care facility staff and residents, uh, you know, that we, we recognize that those are the highest risk individuals and, uh, and we are doing everything we can to prioritize them. In communities that have moved to 1B, there will be, uh, you know, the, the targeted groups, for example, teachers and people who work in factories and in food service, that, that will skew to minority populations in many of our communities. And so they are being prioritized. Concurrently, there are efforts to engage and communicate with the African-American community in particular, but also other minority communities, knowing that there may be uh, other reasons for vaccine hesitancy. Wayne Turnage did a phenomenal job of kind of breaking that down and, and, and talking about his own experience and, uh, and, and the, the, 
the history behind why the African American community may be uh, resistant. And I, I think Dr. Underwood uh, and, and her team put together a, a great event last week with, with Dr. Fauci, uh, Facts and Fiction, really talking about why uh, we need to increase uptake of a vaccine in the minority communities. So I think there's a lot of concurrent work, both in making access uh, to vaccine more available as we work through the tier groups, but also in communicating the importance and the need for uh, uptake in the African American community. Hi, Governor. I'm with the Young Alliance of Roanoke. My question is about your school's guidance. Yes. Um, so, why is now the right time to start talking about planning to get kids back in the classroom? We've seen low transmission rates because of measures they're taking, like social distancing, uh, staying in the classroom lower numbers of kids in the classroom. So what happens when those kids come back and some of those preventative measures aren't possible? And then my second part um, is about timing. So when is it a realistic timeline to get schools back open when we're still trying to vaccinate teachers and schools are likely gonna need a lot of supplies stocked up to make that happen? James, uh, uh, Dr. Lane is, is with us today. Um, you know, just while he's coming up to the podium, a, a couple things I think to, to make clear uh, to Virginians is, is our schools are safe. Um, we know that we can follow the mitigation measures. Uh, the children have been very good about wearing their masks, the teachers, the, the staff uh, uh, with spacing uh, of the children, keeping their distancing, uh, cleansing, uh, all that's gone well. So if you look at the data, uh, schools are very safe. It's the communities that we worry about. And, and so when the numbers are you know, high in our communities, uh, it makes us reluctant to, to, to move forward. But the, the, the overall message here is that, you know, we're getting individuals vaccinated. Um, we expect uh, if people continue to follow the guidelines that our numbers will start coming down. And, and so we really want to prepare and, and, and get families ready, uh, get teachers ready, all of the above, to, uh, to move forward and get our children back in school. The, the last thing I'll say, and I I don't mean to be stealing all of Dr. Lane's thunder, and by the way, I appreciate all that you all have been doing in the Department of Education. Um, but you know, children are hurting right now. Families are hurting. And uh, we hear it every day. Uh, testing results are, are going down. So uh, whether it be to get our children back in school as soon as we can or uh, modifying the summer months to add more days to the school calendar, which is something that we're seriously looking at, we all need to collectively uh, get our children back in school, and that's where they need to be for a lot of different reasons. And so we've put a lot of effort in that. Dr. Lane. Thank you, Governor, and, and thank you for the question. Uh, I believe the question was, you know, why is this guidance coming out now uh, in the context of, you know, potentially some, some surges? And the, the intent of this guidance is to give school divisions the opportunity to prepare for the coming weeks. Uh, the guidance does a couple things. It first uh, takes the CDC indicators everyone should be well familiar with and make sure that they consider community transmission. But it also adds an assessment of a school's ability to mitigate uh, the impact to the actual school building. Uh, it, and it also uh, requires schools to uh, look at their community needs. And then when you, when you see the, the guidance that will be posted here in about 10 minutes, uh, you'll see that there's a matrix to help them make decisions there. And what we know is that we've, ha we've been able to open many of our schools in the Commonwealth quite safely. Uh, there, there have been few outbreaks in schools, and even when there were outbreaks, uh, in most cases there were less than five total cases inside those outbreaks. And so if you follow the mitigation strategies that we outline in the guidance, if there's low impact to the, to the actual school community, even in the context of moderate transmission in the broader community, we know that we can open schools safely. Uh, you asked a question also about, uh, about vaccinations, and vac vaccination is a huge part of the strategy for getting our schools open. But our guidance does not make vaccination a precursor to opening if you can do the safety strategies that are in place. And so we know many of our schools have done this safely. We have uh, many schools that are making plans now, and we wanted to put this out now. So, you know, we don't anticipate that new schools will start opening tomorrow on this guidance. But here in the coming weeks, we expect our school boards to look at this and make decisions based on uh, a, a much more clear matrix around how to do this decision making. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Governor, can you or uh, Secretary Hopkins talk a little bit more about the capacity of the National Guard 
to handle these various assignments? Um, how, how many are you having on standby in Richmond? Uh, is it cutting into their availability for the coronavirus support services? Do you have concerns about burnout or about uh, their, their, their ability to absorb the stress of these multiple deployments? While Secretary Hopkins is making his way to the podium, a, a point that I would make, Greg, and I think you alluded to this with your question, is that uh, the Guard has been very busy uh, this past year, and whether it be uh, natural disasters with storms, flooding, snowstorms, protests, uh, testing, now vaccinations, and what I regret, um, but I am pleased to be able to offer the services of our National Guard. I regret that we have over 2,000 of them in Washington, D.C. right now, protecting our nation's capital from Americans. Um, that should bother everybody. It should bother everybody when you walk out this building and see boards across the windows of our state capitol. So the point I'm making is that these men and women of our National Guard, men and women of all these police uh, units that are doing such uh, heroic work, there are a lot of other things that they could and should be doing right now. And one of those things for our Guard is to help with the uh, distribution of vaccinations. So I am hopeful uh, that peace will remain uh, in our nation's capital and here in Richmond and that we can get them back uh, into Virginia as soon as we can so that they can carry out these other missions. Secretary Hopkins. Thank you, Greg, for the question. I think your question was in two, well, three parts, actually. Um, capacity and, I believe, burnout. And I think the governor addressed the sort of the resilience issue. Um, let me talk about capacity briefly. Um, whenever we get a mission for the National Guard, we make sure that we have the necessary resources to staff that mission. Uh, and so our work in the district we're able to staff that separately from the security for the Capitol here, which is also a separate mission from what we do with the vaccine distribution or the testing program. And so prior to, there's a lot of logistical planning that goes into any of these activities, but prior to putting the Guard forward on a mission, we make sure that we have the resources in place to address it. So the short answer is, yes, we have the capacity to carry out every mission we've done. Now, that does not mean that we're not, as the governor indicated, asking the Guard to do a lot. Uh, but we try to make sure that we put the resources in place before we commit them so they can carry out these respective missions. Uh, with respect to burnout, and I touched on this a little bit earlier in my remarks, you know, we have an incredibly resilient force, a group of over 8,500 men and women who really love public service and, and service to this nation. And our commanders and our leaders do everything they can to make sure that they, they take care of the needs of our Guard members, not just equipment and the resources, but also their health care needs, their emotional needs, et cetera, making sure that they're able to spend appropriate time with family. Uh, we work in to the scheduled downtime um, and other ways to make sure that we're taking care of the members of the force. We make sure that we provide the necessary meals, the necessary lodging, uh, and other resources to take, take care of them as well. So uh, they're an incredibly resilient group. They're an incredibly proud group, a group that's, that loves to serve the Commonwealth and this nation. Uh, and so we, we're always looking out for things that could lead to burnout, but we do take the necessary steps to, to try to keep that from happening as much as possible. And did I address each of your questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Andre. Uh, Governor, for those who... You mean do we have time, Andre? We <laughs> always have time. For those who are trying to link the recent events... In, at the, nation, at the uh, U.S. Capitol with the events that we saw in terms of protest riots, if you will, over the summer. How would you respond to those folks? And then secondly... Let me just address that very quick. There is absolutely no connection, so no comparison. Secondly, in terms of cost of the uh, vaccine, <coughs> for those who are poor and uninsured and they have questions about the logistics in, in terms of how they would get the vaccine, uh, the meat and potatoes, if you will. Sure. I might let Dr. Avula just address that, but there, I can just assure that nobody will have to incur any expense uh, as we vaccinate Virginia's population. So, Dan, is there anything? Norm? You? I've been overruled here. All right. Dr. <laughs> Oliver, welcome. <laughs> Danny told me to answer. Uh, no out-of-pocket expense to anyone who gets this vaccine. Um, 
If you have insurance, your insurance can bill for the administrative costs. If you uh, are Medicaid and Medicare, Medicare, they will pay for the administrative costs. And uh, health, uh, HHS has a special uh, fund, a provider relief fund, that will pay for those administrative costs for people who are uninsured. Thank you all very much, and uh, we look forward to being with you again. Uh, but in the meantime, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you.